Last time on Ranking Elden Ring Bosses, we covered the top 20-something easiest bosses in the game, some of which were still pretty freaking hard. This time, we're onto the hardest bosses in the whole game. 500 of you voted, and I'm going to give you the results. For anybody who's curious on the stats of the last video, What do you want from me? We want the numbers, Mason. That's all we've ever wanted. Here you go. This time, we're going to show you the numbers to give you guys a better picture of how the ranking shaped up. Let's -a go. Number 20, Godskin Apostle. Slotting in right above his chubster counterpart, Apostle just ekes his way into the top 20. Godskin Noble under Apostle? Madness! I couldn't agree more. At least in terms of the intuitiveness of dodges, Apostle came quite naturally to me. I will say, when I faced Apostle, I was vastly lower level than when I finally met Noble, but I think the matchup in the Godskin duo solidified Noble as harder. I never focused on Noble because I knew he was going to punish me a lot harder than the Apostle variant. Apostle definitely does have a lot of tricks up his sleeve, and his moveset is pretty huge. I definitely got caught by his massive AoE more than once, and that thing one-shots you pretty much, and his propeller and slinky movement can be hard to get used to, being so different from the rest of the game. Number 19, Elamir of the Briar. Another Elden Ring twist on the typical knight with armor combat we've become accustomed to. Elamir uses force powers to throw us off. Typically, when you face an enemy in a Souls game, as long as they aren't unbelievably aggressive, you can dodge back to gain a moment of respite, heal, and launch back into battle. This formula can be shaken up with enemies that have magic or other ranged attacks thrown into the mix. But Elamir just throws his sword into the mix. Because it's so different than what we're used to, his combos are so long, Four swipes are a lot harder to read, and he has insane damage, it's truly challenging to make it all work in such a small room. Thankfully, his one weakness seems to be hyper-aggression, as posture breaks and viscerals were my key to success. I don't know if I'd say I'd mastered this fight, but I found a way to hobble to victory by matching his insane aggression. Number 18, Lich Dragon Fortisax. Alright, let's get this out of the way first. The limited health pool is the only reason this difficulty didn't skyrocket. In comparison to some of the other top tier challenges on this list, the fight with Fortisax can be over in a relatively short time frame. With that one knock on difficulty out of the way, the rest is all a pain train. If you don't die while taking in the unapologetic badassery of a black dragon with red lightning manifesting weapons into existence and using them to pummel you into submission, then the lightning trail that attaches to you whenever you're close to him will. While I didn't vehemently struggle with this encounter myself, I think it's a very reasonable placement considering the vast arsenal of attacks ready to rip you apart. Number 17, Crucible Knight. Barely, and I mean 0 .01 levels of barely edging out Lich Dragon, this much smaller, less imposing foe takes number 17. I have to admit, I hated Crucible Knight when I first faced him. When I popped into the Limgrave Everjails as an Elden Ring noob, I was constantly baffled at how unbeatable enemies seemed. The Bloodhound Knight dude was incredibly challenging for me at a base level, and the Ancient Hero of Zamora wasn't much easier. Once I topped these two Dancer of the Boreal Valley inspired weenies, I headed over to the Crucible Knight's lair, and I was met with unmatched punishment. Crucible Knight is kind of similar to the Tree Sentinel in the fact that you meet him in a place where you are not fully prepared for an ass blasting. The difference here is that Crucible Knight is multiple times harder from my perspective. A consistent pain point for Elden Ring bosses is their unbelievably deceptive range. This includes Melania and her arena-length katana, Moog's ungodly trident, and the Crucible Knight. Part of this has to do with his unexpected quickness. The Crucible Knight's design conjured memories of Dragon Rider from Dark Souls 2 and his slow and lumbering presence. Fortunately, or unfortunately, this is a different game and a different enemy. This one moves with quick precision and a larger attack pool than many of the bosses of the series. He even comes complete with phase transitions. Once you learn his vast array of moves, his difficulty falls somewhat, but for having deceptive range, deceptive speed, a huge health pool, tons of damage in such an early game area, I could even see him placing in my top 15. Number 16, Draconic's Free Sentinel this guy. Despite all of the Elden Ring boss criticism, I love nearly every main boss in the game, but a few of the mini bosses managed to make me straight up want to rage quit. There's one more of those left on this list. But first, Draconic Tree Sentinel. At this point, I've mastered the fight and can generally take down Draconic Tree Sentinels with ease, but for some reason, this fight still pisses me off. First off, he's again coded, like another bad boss in the game, to instantly hit you with ranged fireballs whenever you attempt to heal. He is absolutely mandatory, guarding progress from the main story. 
He has insane defense due to his armored nature. He cannot be visceraled even when staggered, meaning you're not rewarded fully for precise offensives. He has a phase 2 and damage fitting of the hardest main bosses, and the massive AoEs suck the fun right out of me. The most frustrating attack of all is a lightning strike that comes out of Nameless King's playbook, which I found timing very difficult. The problem with all this frustration is that it's a mini boss that is reused as well, meaning that all this excessive difficulty feels kinda unwarranted. To give it credit, I suppose the boss is meant to be a level check before wandering into the capital, and for that I can give it some leeway. But I died more to this boss than all but three of the main bosses in the game. A true challenge, and you deserve the reward of one of the best areas in Soulsborne for besting it. Number 15, Fire Giant. Ah, yet another one of the more divisive bosses of the game. I've seen this boss listed as the absolute worst of the game, all the way up to top 10 lists in quality. For now though, let's talk difficulty. Raphael Shuck says, For me the Fire Giant has to be one of the easiest bosses. Every other mandatory boss in the game killed me like 10 times at least, and I defeated the Fire Giant first try, being a little underleveled. And my city replied with, agree. Fire Giant is so easy. I actually couldn't agree more. Although Fire Giant has massive damage and one-shot potential at low vigors, I had stacked enough to survive his ungodly damage. If I did get hit, which was rarely, I had ample time to recover with a gulp of Sunny D. The weak spots give key points of focus for plenty of damage even with his monstrous health bar. Beating the Fire Giant on my rune level 1 run wasn't even particularly challenging, as I utilized a bleed bill that shredded him even quicker. Perhaps a pain point for some is their struggle to read the Fire Giant's moveset, but I found it quite intuitive to just stare at his legs in preparation for when he would slam. I rarely got hit, and when I did, I could recover. I understand why some could find this on the harder end, but of the main bosses, he was easy as cake in my book. You guys clearly disagree, and the Fire Giant lands in the top 15. Number 14, Margit, the Fell Omen. I feel like Margit has to be close to the top. For where he is in the game, his attack variety, damage, health, and everything is crazy. While there are many harder bosses, I feel like he killed me the most. Margit stonewalled me so hard. Oh Margit, you lovable lovable asshole. I am shocked that you guys voted Margit at a 6.53. I would personally put Margit at at least an 8 or 9, particularly from where you fight him in the game. He is by far the hardest first boss of any Soulsborne game. Even if you decide to include Gascoin. A monumental Bloodborne challenge, I think Margit is above that. Featuring conjured weapons that evolve his moveset, deadly combos, punishing delays, ranged assaults, and more, Margit is a huge barrier to entry into one of the best games of all time. I'm genuinely curious how many players stop on their Elden Ring journey because of Margit. Sure, there are other barriers like Tree Sentinel to stop players in their tracks, but when you meet Margit, it appears like a mandatory battle. You must beat this thing before doing anything else. Of course, the open world is beckoning to you, and I think Margit was made to be difficult to teach you this lesson once and for all. Leave and come back. Me, being the stubborn man I am, said no. Based on my personal deaths per enemy, Margit would have placed in my top 6, and I think people who voted him as easier than a 6 must have developed memory loss from the amount of times Margit bashed in their heads. Margit was even a focal point in one of my video essays where I talk about the meaning Elden Ring can bring to your life, and how it can change it. I'll link that as well if you guys are interested. Number 13, Valiant Gargoyle Duo. Okay, you guys really hate this fight. Upon further inspection, I can see why. In my initial quality rankings, I placed the gargoyles lower on the list, but mentioned how a lot about the fight made me a happy souls boy. The arena is splendid, the callback to the bell gargoyles, and the design of the enemies individually is fun. But I will say one thing that makes this fight way harder than it needs to be is the rate at which the poison takes away at your health as an AoE effect. I'm not sure why they decided to do this when in previous battles they utilized poison as a strictly status effect, such as in the Demon Prince. In this case, if you find yourself stranded in their green cough gas, you will be instantly drained of insane amounts of HP. And it can be kind of confusing which way is best to run as the poison covers such a huge area. That, combined with the skinny legs, make the hitboxes difficult to connect with, and this means that there can be frustrating battles where you run around trying to hit the gargoyles, only to be insta-killed by a quick hit into poison poop cloud. Thankfully, the first gargoyle gives you ample time to get a lot of hits in, meaning you can at least get him low, if not kill him, before the second really engages in the fight. This might be a test of how early you find them, but I'd recommend using the new Souls Golden Rule. Leave and come back at a higher level. Goodbye, booty smacking days. Number 12. Full grown falling star beast. The battle with this majestic beast is unparalleled in a world of disgusting, depraved beings. It's akin to a jousting match with fate as the only judge.
All right, just kidding. I'm gonna be honest, this is the other mini boss I can't f***ing stand. I'm also willing to admit, however, that this is more of a problem from my end than a problem with design. There are ample counter opportunities, albeit somewhat obscure. The beast has a wild range of attacks that can be difficult to master the dodge timings of. He has unbelievable defense, akin to the Draconic Tree Sentinel, and is somehow also faster than Torrent. I was lost on how to face this boss until I saw Magicat absolutely destroy it in his rankings video. Maybe I won't ever master it, but I could hardly take the time to learn this guy's moves because I was too busy punching my monitor over and over again. Number 11, Morgoth, the Omen King. Take everything about Margot and kick it up a notch for Morgoth. Notice I said a notch, not two, not 10. This boss is definitely harder than Margot in my mind, but not by that much. While Morgoth has vastly more offensive options at his disposal and is certainly more punishing from a damage and combo perspective, he is not quite as tanky. His health, assuming you have upgraded your weapon proficiently, is slightly more flimsy. This means that the battle is a fast-paced, action-packed, rapid duel between two aggressive opponents. At times it can feel like Morgoth never stops attacking and his conjured weapons are fully utilized in his assaults. You never know what to expect and the constant unpredictability keeps you on your toes. One mistimed dodge can lead to four, five, six hits straight of pure devastation. Once you do learn the openings though, it can be quite punishing for Morgoth. Ranged attacks such as the Moonveil weapon art and sorceries can be spammed as he summons his reigning swords attack, and he becomes much easier with familiarity. I can't argue with your votes though. The people have spoken. Number 10, Commander Neil. The top 10 marks our entry into the world of sevens, and Commander Niall or Neil is worthy of the placing, at least in the first half. Commander Niall, living up to his name of commanding, summons two warriors. These guys hurt, badly. He can even buff them as he passively stands by, but their glass cannon and rapid movement can quickly one-shot you at any level if you're not careful. Thankfully, once you take them out, the commander takes you on, one-on-one. -on -one. This guy is a straight-up badass, with huge lightning and frost moves that are fitting of a snowy castle top battle. I swear this feels like it's straight out of a movie. Thankfully, his combos are slower and telegraphed, but the damage is still no joke. Certainly a challenge, and one that you're going to want to stack vigor for. Otherwise, perhaps summon to match his dirty way of battling for the first section, or you're going to face an icy doom rather often. Number 9, Dragonlord Placidusax. Barely surpassing the commander, we head straight on to one of the other most epic battles in Elden Ring, or even in FromSoft history. This battle though, rather than being a constant one-shot threat like Niall, is more like a battle of attrition. Placidusax has a girthy ass health bar, but his only one-shot potential really comes from his ultimate attack at the end of the fight. I find myself running out of flasks more often than not, meaning you have to be precise from beginning to end. Half of the challenge comes from the fear of not knowing where he's going to show up when he teleports. My carpal tunnel inducing random spaz fest after he disappears is... Ah! Some of the attacks can be really hard to read, especially in a first encounter. For example, the fire breath that comes behind is really hard to see, and the lingering AoEs can be challenging to stay on top of. I found myself getting hit a ton by a lot of stuff, but... I ended up surviving in the end and taking down this beast. Number eight, all these stupid duo fights. There are so many hard duo fights that I did not want to take the time to fight again, get new footage of, and have to individually talk about and rank. Because, well, a lot of them kind of suck. I'm talking Crucible Knight duo, Tree Sentinel duo, Crucible and Leonine Misbegotten, the list goes on. So I lumped them all into one category. Of course, this muddles the rankings a bit because we can't see where each one of them individually placed, but I listed this as a question of where you'd rank the challenging duo fights, and listed Crucible Knight Duo as an example. I'm guessing a lot of people utilize summons in fights like these because it's the main time that it feels fair. When you're outnumbered and the AI isn't designed to collaborate in a fair and challenging manner, sometimes evening the odds is the best course of action. I skipped some of these fights as... I had no desire in fighting double of what I had already overcome. It felt lazy and unfair, and I'll take your words for it. I did fight the Leonin and Crucible Knight, and while that did feel unfair and lazy, at least it did utilize the halfway spawning mechanic previously mentioned with the Gargoyles. These duo fights are spammed regularly throughout the game, and without summons, it kind of becomes a mad dash to find the smallest openings for damage. Alternatively, you could try to face tank with OP weapon arts, but in general, these fights can easily become overwhelming as both bosses dive the ever-living crap out of you. I'd like to know if you guys think that any of these duo fights actually mesh pretty well and are underrated, because I certainly haven't faced all of them. 
If I had to guess, I'd probably say the average player who doesn't summon would have a harder time with these than the position would suggest, simply due to the nature of being overwhelmed. Let me know what you guys think down below. And please drop a like if you're enjoying the content, and subscribe for more, I have a lot of Elden Ring content on the way. Number 7, Star Scourge Radon. Stan Curran says, my top 5 bosses for difficulty. Number 5, Radon. Number 4, okay we don't need to go through them all. The point of that was to say, somebody has Radon there post nerf. Radon can be kinda hard to quantify, because there are technically 3 stages of difficulty you could have faced him at, plus the variability of summons, plus the variability of the open world. Radon pre-nerf is said to have ravaged the tarnished who dared wash upon his battle-torn shores. Radon post-nerf is said to have struggled to kill a single one, and the current state is somewhere in the middle. I personally faced him pre-nerf, but I utilized the summons so the fight wasn't too challenging. Dashing off into battle with my boys was a huge highlight of the game, but we were able to stagger him and get him to under 40% before he even jumped and did his Descent of Doom. I did fight him one-on-one -on -one in my rune level 1 playthrough and I didn't struggle too much post nerf. I do think he has like an inordinate amount of complex mechanics including the entire run up to him and his size and speed are so formidable it probably scares some people away. I don't personally think he's quite impossible in his current state but as a solo venture it's one that will certainly give you plenty of juicy souls headaches in the best way possible. Number 6, Godfrey, First Elden Lord, slash Horalu, Warrior. If we're going off deaths from first encounters, Godfrey would be my number 3. I just could not figure out how to balance his non-stop aggression of phase 2. But let's take a step back to that first phase. As we saw previously with Stan Karan, there are plenty of people who would put Godfrey at number 1. His first phase isn't much different than the previously ranked Spirit variant, with the big difference being a phase 1.5 with arena-wide stomps. The damage and aggression feel cranked up here, but the combat does feel fluid and fair. Jump attacks are encouraged as Godfrey smashes the earth with regular stomps to threaten the Goombas. As I said though, that all goes out the window with phase 2. Now that I've gotten a bit more accustomed to it, I can see what's coming and prepare accordingly, but it's kinda like if Gascoin phase 2 was only grabs. This phase feels relentless, particularly when you try to get a moment to heal. At any moment, Horalu could follow up with an arena-wide grab that ends any prospects of vigor restoration. I was practically gonna smash my computer when I got grabbed for the eighth time in a row trying to heal. I could easily get to phase two with hardly any heals used, just to see all ten dwindle away from grab after grab after grab. He can sometimes even switch up the timings on the grabs, and it's a thrilling and downright brutal battle. Definitely a peak challenge of Elden Ring, and one that you're going to need every trick in the book to come out on top in. Number 5, Godskin Duo. Representing a notable spiked and ranked difficulty, Godskin Duo has brought us to the top 5 in our 8 out of 10 difficulty rankings. I'm surprised the numbers are as low as they are at this stage of the list, because I think this game poses multiple 10 out of 10 difficulty boss fights in my mind. When I first played Dark Souls 1, I was essentially a series veteran. I had battled through all of Dark Souls 3 and Dark Souls 2 and was ready for anything the game had to throw at me. When I met the fabled Ornstein and Smo, I was ready to have that idea blasted from my brain by a golden duo. That's not what happened at all. At most, I may have died a couple times, as the bosses are coded beautifully and fairly. They give ample time of reprieve and openings for punishment, and the intuitive nature of the fight is surpassed only by its epicness. Fast forward 10 years and we have the Godskin duo. The real trouble of this fight isn't too different from the aforementioned duo Bonanza. There are so many strangely coded duo fights in this game, and the required Godskin duo is no exception. This time, however, each has a ranged attack and feels compelled to spam it regularly, and you can't win by just killing each one once. If I'm remembering my first bout correctly, you have to kill them three and a half times. If you have insane levels of damage, the time it takes for each to respawn can be a free opening to down the next one. But I didn't have enough damage at the time I faced these poop socks. I was at the mercy of RNG Jesus, hoping for plenty of viscerals and lucky attacks. The amount of aimless sprinting around the arena required to beat this fight, with anything less than monumental damage, is frustrating, and at any point your run could be cut short by a devastating combo. Good luck Tarnished, you're gonna need it to take out these two ONS knockoffs. Number 4, Moog, Lord of Blood. I remember the first time I faced Moog. I wandered into the arena expecting a brutal and disgusting, even evil opponent. Due to the preceding area, what I was met with was exactly that in Moog. Lord of Blood. I thought the fight was everything I expected. Challenging, but fair. And then phase 2 happened. Oh. 
holy sh**. This phase 2 is brutal, disgusting, and evil times 10. It's hard to believe they managed to pack so many challenging concepts together into this one battle and have it all function fluidly. The sheer variety of attacks, constant blood flame coating the arena, range of attacks, and the countdown that sends shivers down your spine before draining your flasks, it's almost too much to take in. Man, I love this guy. Number 3, Malekith, the Black Blade. Oh, death. Become my blade once more. My personal runner-up for difficulty makes it to the top three. Let's hear what Travisaurus' dissertation has to provide us. Hardest boss? Beast Clergyman slash Malekith. Yes, I beat Melania, I still think this is harder. Making it through the first phase, every attempt is a chore because you have a total of about three openings he almost never gives, and if you ever attack him when he doesn't want to be attacked, he will counter with an undodgeable rock throw right in your face, and half of your health is gone. Overall, the first phase is just dull and boring. The second phase is almost worse. I do want to say though that that transition cutscene is one of my favorite cutscenes in the game, and his design is amazing. The second phase is the most frustrating thing to learn ever because he kills you in 1-2 to two hits, and every time you die, you have to spend 5 minutes fighting phase 1 again. Fun! Not to mention Judgment Cut. This move will kill you whenever it wants to. At least with Waterfowl Dance, it doesn't stagger you too much so if it hits you once you're not locked into it. The hardest boss I've fought in any game, and not a fun one. I'm not salty. While I can't agree with the salt, I can't agree with the oppressive difficulty. Spoiler alert, Malakath found a spot on my top 10 hardest bosses of Soulsborne list. I swear you guys tried so hard to gaslight me by saying this fight was easy as hecky, so I did a second run of the game. I blasted through the whole thing with relative ease before hitting Malakath, at which point I hit an astronomical difficulty spike and continued to feed my brains out to the boss over and over. I stand by my original placing and will do so until I get good, I suppose. I still can't beat him on rune level 1 though, no way. Number 2, Radagon of the Golden Order plus Elden Beast. Another unbelievably close scoring difference of only .02, the final duo of the game slightly takes the second place spot. Radagon and the Elden Beast was the hardest boss fight for me. It took me around 11 hours to beat them. Moog especially touched my poopy hole for hours when, uh... Okay, I'm not gonna stop reading that. I'm sorry for you and your poopy hole, but hey, maybe it was stimulating for your brain at least. While I can't agree that these two pose a formidable challenge, mostly because of the length of the fight, I can't say I agree with the second place position. At the very least, I dropped them below Malekith, as I was consistently one-shot by that beastly beast. I felt like I knew what to do with Radagon and Elden Beast. I suppose the fight is more intuitive, where at times I could not figure out where I needed to be positioned or when I needed to dodge against Malekith. There are certainly moments of fighting these two that can be extremely overwhelming, such as when Elden Stars is combined with other projectiles. Radagon himself has a lot of teleporting, and his constant AoEs can be hard to master. A challenge of the ages to be sure, but one place is higher. Number 1, Melania, Blade of Mikula, and Goddess of Rot. Oh. My. God. Do you see the difference here? Look at that spike from 2 to 1. It's not even close. I get a few comments a day about how Melania is easy, but I guess the community has spoken. Melania is undoubtedly the hardest boss of Elden Ring, and perhaps the hardest in Soulsborne based on this ranking. Look at the amount of 10s you guys gave! While the community doesn't seem to be divided on Melania being one of the biggest challenges to date, they certainly disagree on the quality. Melania is so close to being a 10, but the healing and a certain combo attack that won't be named just bring her down a lot for me. While the move that won't be named may be bringing down the quality, it certainly brings the difficulty up. The fact that at any point you could be one shot and if you do happen to barely survive, you can undo minutes of previous progress means that it is not only a one shot battle, but a battle of attrition. The Rot Flurry is perhaps the most challenging move in the series with an extra impossibly OP status effect, and I think we can all agree that this one is a bit of a challenge. Melania is definitely the top boss of Elden Ring. For one, the boss arena, boss design, and OST are a 10 out of 10. Aside from that, the fight is near perfect as well, with the incredible mechanics and excellent moveset. F waterfowl though. Even the people who love Melania can't handle certain parts of her battle, as it appears to ask so much of the player. You need every skill possibly attainable in Elden Ring to take out this goddess, so good luck to the tarnished yet to beat her. For the rest of us, yes.
Thank you so much for being a part of this series, guys. I do have all of the quality rankings lined up as well, so be sure to subscribe for more content, like the video if you enjoyed, and check out my other videos. Thanks for watching.